Hi, in this video I've got another Nano VNA to review. This time it is a SAA-2N V2, which supports a frequency range between 50 kHz to 3 GHz. And by the way, I left a stylus on top of the LCD so that it can help it focus, otherwise there is not much contrast and uh, the image is going to come out blurred. On this channel, we have reviewed two other Nano VNAs recently. One is a Nano VNA-V2, which also operates within the same frequency range and is very well engineered, enclosed in a gorgeous metal case and has a 4.3-inch LCD. The other one is a Light VNA Model 62, and what is special about this Light VNA is that it's capable of operating between 50 kHz all the way up to 6.3 GHz, which is pretty much the only choice you have for a similar price if you need to reach that upper frequency range. Be sure to check out my review and teardown videos if you haven't already, so you can decide for yourself which one of these meets your needs. The SAA-2N V2 Nano VNA I have here on the bench is provided to me by Banggood. You can check out the product link included in the video description below if you decided to get one after watching this video. And also don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more videos like this in the future. Anyway, the N version I have here has these N connectors instead of the SMA connectors found on most of the other Nano VNAs you see. Of course, if you prefer the SMA connectors, you can just get the standard SAA-2 instead of the 2N version. And the reason you might want to choose the N connector over the SMA connector is largely depending on the devices under test that you are working with. Most of the antennas in the lab that I have, for instance, are using N connectors. You probably noticed that when I did the measurements in my previous review video that I used an SMA to N adapter connector like this one so that I can connect the antenna to my Nano VNAs. But if I were to use this Nano VNA, I wouldn't need to use the adapter as both ends are using the N connectors. So in this case, it would be far more convenient. Besides convenience, Measurement accuracy is probably the more important reason you want to reduce the usage of adapters whenever possible. Because these devices are calibrated at the ports, any addition changes the electrical length and other RF characteristics and attenuations in the signal. So for sensitive measurements, especially at higher frequencies, you should probably recalibrate based on the adapters you are using, instead of simply adding the electrical length to these calibrated ports. This Nano VNA comes in a rather nice carrying case along with this calibration kit, a through and a two short end connector coaxes. Unfortunately, not sure if you can see here, but uh, I was sent two of these load connectors without a short connector, so I'm not able to accurately calibrate this Nano VNA at this moment. So I'm going to concentrate on the teardown in this video and we'll probably do another video when I manage to get hold of a short calibration connector. Since the SAA-2 design is open sourced, we should be able to dig a little deeper in our teardown. Before I do the teardown, I do want to turn it on and uh, take a quick look at the firmware. It would operate very similarly to other Nano VNAs that we have reviewed. The concept is pretty much the same. Depending on the firmware you use, there are some slight different features included. And one thing I did notice is that uh, this Nano VNA is significantly slower in terms of scanning speed compared to the other two Nano VNAs I used before. So let me try to show you that. Let's uh, do a calibrate. By the way, I was playing with it. You can see that we already calibrated this specific uh, settings here. But let me reset all. You will see that now it started to rescan everything, and uh, the scanning speed is not very fast compared to the other ones that we have done reviews before. And also, actually, the calibration is very slow as well. I think it took more than five seconds for each of the calibration. So let's take a quick look here. Of course, we're not going to do a full calibration, but let's uh, put on this open connector. And I just want to show you the speed here, so you get a sense. So if I press this open, 
you see that it's currently being calibrated. Now, for the other two nano VNAs, it took a fraction of seconds. So that this one did take around five seconds. So that is something to remember when you are getting this uh, nano VNA. I will show you all the features later on in a proper review video. But uh, right now, I want to show you one more thing here is uh, if you go to, let's see if I can find it again. If you go to display, I think, and you will see that we are able to flip the display. And right now I flip it this way so that the ports facing down is actually upright, but you can flip it and it become the other way around. And this is actually quite important for these kind of uh, devices, especially with the uh, end connector. The reason is the cables are not as uh, flexible as the SMA cables. So sometimes it depends on where the DUT is sitting at, you may have trouble orienting this at the correct orientation. So flipping the screen seems to be a very nice touch to the firmware here. And by the way, the Light VNA62 that I reviewed last time also has the same feature as well. Depends on which side you typically put your device under test, you can flip the screen back and forth as well. And uh, let's uh, quickly check out the firmware here. So for that, I'm going back to config and uh, version. So as you can see that this is actually using one of the open source version of the firmware, which is good to know. Okay, now it's time for us to open it up and uh, take a look inside. Once the screws are removed, the entire assembly just slides right out. One thing to point out is that the case coming with this actually is a steel case rather than a aluminum case, so it actually feels very heavy here. The LCD used in this uh, SA-2 is a 3.95-inch LCD with a resistive touch overlay that you can probably see from these connectors here. And another thing you notice immediately that uh, this one is uh, different than most of the nano VNAs we have done tear down with is that it actually uses a sandwiched board design. Another thing is that this piece is actually loose. Now that's because these end connectors are tensioned on the case. Once it's assembled, this piece is pushed back that adds enough tension so that they do not move. But as soon as you take it out, you can see that this piece is actually not tightened. Another thing you will notice immediately is how these end connectors are connected to the board. Instead of using a coax, they chose to use this SMA elbow connector. Now, I suspect the reason is because this board also supports the standard SMA connector. Therefore, it's probably far easier for them to do this way. What I'm going to do next is to remove this top board so that we can see what is underneath. Now, I need to be very careful as the battery is still connected. So I will do this off camera so I can concentrate. And when I open it up, we'll come back and take a look. Now I have taken these two boards apart and also have removed all the shielding hands so that we can take a closer look. One thing I do want to point out is that the top LCD board is rested on the bottom board via four standoffs. But if you notice that only two standoffs were actually screwed on, the other two standoffs are actually aligned with these two holes, but they're not screwed on the bottom. They're only screwed at the top. So my guess is that the two standoffs, one here and one here, are not really used to fix the board, but rather to just hold it up, as the board actually is secured by these two standoffs and the headers where they are mated. I think I forgot to show you guys the specification of this uh, SAA-2 earlier, so we'll do it right here. Now, if you take a look at the spec sheet, you will notice that all the parameters are essentially identical to those we have shown earlier in that Nano BNA-FV2 review video. And this is not coincidental as most of the synthesizers and the front end and uh, the mixers used are essentially the same. That's why the specs here are also the same in terms of uh, frequency range, dynamic range, and the noise floor. For this Nano VNA, the power supply current is also published. We can see that it is between 350 milliamps to 400 milliamps max. And if you take a look at the battery supplied with this Nano VNA, you will see we have a 3000 milliamp hour battery. So that it means we have a operation time of at least seven or eight hours, which is excellent. 
Before we get into the details on the board, let's take a quick look at the overall hardware architecture here. If you look at this architectural diagram, you will see that the SA-2 is essentially a single switched receiver VNA. By controlling the RF switches located at various positions, the receiver can be used to measure the reference, reflected signal, and the through signals. Because of this switched receiver design, you will see a lot of these RF switches throughout the system here. We also have quite a few of these RF synthesizers here, and they're used to both generating the LO and also to provide the stimulus signals. There are three of these synthesizers. Two of them are these ADF4350s, and one of this is used on the transmitter side. The other one is used on the receiver side. These two synthesizers are responsible for covering frequencies above 140 MHz all the way to 3 GHz. In the middle here, we have a SI5351, and this synthesizer covers frequencies up to 140 MHz and is shared between the transmitting and receiving circuitry. So with this uh, architectural diagram out of the way, let's uh, take a look at the actual circuits here. First, let's take a look at this display board. We saw this board a little bit earlier while examining the battery capacity. The controlling circuitry for the LCD is actually integrated into the LCD itself. And the only circuitry here is for the touchscreen controller. So the chip here is an HR2046 controller chip for the touchscreen. One thing interesting is that you see here we have an empty footprint for a SD card by the look of it. So now I'm wondering if there is actually a version of the SAA-2 actually has that SD card footprint populated. Next, let's take a look at the backside of the main board. There were originally two shielding cans, one on this side, one on the other side. These are clipped on. I temporarily removed them so we can take a look at what is underneath. The S11 port is on the right hand side here and you can see we have two of these RF transformers and they are part of the directional coupler implementation. And everything else on this side of the board seems to be all passives, nothing else interesting. So let's uh, flip it over and take a look at this side. I think I understand what they did with the end connector now. And you can see this board is probably the same board for both the SAA-2 and SAA-2N version. And the only difference is, of course, the 2N has this uh, end connector. So they simply just hooked the N to SMA adapter onto the original SMA adapter here. Now, I don't know why they soldered it on. Probably they don't want it to come loose. But uh, the problem here is once it's soldered on, you cannot remove that easily anymore. But I suppose that's probably not going to be an issue here. The beauty of this SA-2 being fully open sourced means we actually have the circuit diagram. So I'll try to reference it here when I'm talking about the circuitry. One thing very interesting is on this side, you will see that we actually have four shielding can footprints here, but uh, in reality, we only had two, which I had removed. One is on this side. The other one is covering this section of the circuitry. I'm actually quite surprised they did not use all four shielding cans here, as these circuitries are very sensitive, and uh, the cost saving by removing two of them are not that significant. I suppose someone did the homework and by removing two of them probably did not cause any performance degradation. And when you think about it, that's probably okay because we have a shielding can here that essentially reduces the interference between this portion of the circuitry and this portion. And similarly, we have one at the bottom here. So that reduces the interference between this portion and that portion. Now, these two are not covered, but they are relatively further apart. So that may have, have very minimal interference after all. Also, the entire circuitry is enclosed in the metal case. So that helped to reduce any environmental impact on these circuits. But if I were to do that myself, I would definitely put shielding cans on all these sections. Anyway, let's uh, take a look at the details here. So to the upper left corner here, we have a TP5305. That's the 8-pin chip down there. And that's a charging controller. So that is responsible for charging the onboard lithium ion battery. 
On either side of this micro USB port, yes, that's a micro USB, not a USB C, which I'm a little bit disappointed, as most of the nano VNAs I have seen are all using USB C now, and this design is still a little bit old fashioned, I guess. So on either side, we have this ADF4350 wideband synthesizer with integrated VCO. Now, this chip is, as we mentioned earlier, one for the transmitter, one for the receiver. So there are two of them. And it is responsible for synthesizing frequencies between 140 megahertz all the way up to 3 gigahertz. Now, the chip itself is actually capable of generating frequencies between 137.5 megahertz all the way to 4.4 gigahertz. Now moving on to this section of the board, we have three of these tiny chips. These are 8641RF switches. Each one is a single pole four throw switch. Now these are responsible to switch signal path into the mixer. The middle section here, that's our baseband amplifier. We also have a couple of these 8641s. Now, this chip here is a 5351. That's the low frequency synthesizer that we mentioned earlier which is responsible for generating any frequency up to 140 megahertz. And here we have a GS8722, which is an op-amp for amplification of the baseband signal. Towards the bottom right, this section is the mixer section. This chip marked with a Q01, that's actually an analog device's 8342, which is an active mixer, which can handle frequencies up to 3.8 gigahertz. And of course, we also have quite a few of these 8641s sprinkled around here as well. And on the right hand side, right next to this header, we have two chips. One is an AP3419, which is a buck converter. And the other one is this XC6206, which is an LDO linear regulator. Now, these two are generating the voltages needed by the analog and digital circuitry on this board. That's pretty much all I wanted to cover in this video. Once I get my short calibration adapter, I will make another video with some experiments to fully test this Nano VNA out. If you liked the video, please give it a big thumbs up and remember to subscribe to the channel. I will catch up with you next time.